Today, I'm excited to have a conversation with Marian Nessel. Marian is the Paulette Goddard Professor of Nutrition, Food Studies and Public Health Emerita at New York University. Her work for a long time has explored how socioeconomic forces shape food choice and its public health effects with a focus on the food industry marketing. She blogs regularly at foodpolitics.com, is on Twitter at, at Marian Nessel, and has been a really influential thinker in food and food politics for many decades. Marian, welcome. It's really wonderful to have you. Oh, glad to be here. So, you know, let's talk about your new book for a second. I love the title of your new book, Slow Cooked, An Unexpected Life in Food Politics. You know, why do you call your life in food politics unexpected? Can you just tell us a little bit about the path that led to your work? Well, I certainly didn't start out uh, thinking that I would end up this way. I mean, I was always interested in food. Once I discovered it, I really loved it. It's something where you have immense amounts of pleasure several times a day, guaranteed. It's pretty great. Um, but I grew up in, the, you know, I came of age in the 1950s when expectations for women in America were extremely low. And you were expected to get married and have children. And hey, I did that. Uh, I was married at 19. I still can't. I look back on it and think I did what? Um, but that's what I did. And I have two lovely children to show for it. Um, <clears throat> but I certainly had no ambitions for myself. I didn't know it was possible to have ambitions. I didn't know it was possible to want to have a career or to uh, develop a a lifetime interest in something that would be satisfying and rewarding and maybe even useful. Uh, I just had no idea those options were possible. And that came about, I was the first person in my family to go to, to college. I came from a very poor family. Uh, my father died when I was 13. Um, and I didn't get along with my mother very well. Uh, and the, uh, there was a lot of discouragement of any kind of ambition. So if I expressed anything that sounded like ambition, and I had very good instincts, um, I think, looking back on it, they were slapped down hard. Hmm. Um, and so that by the time I finished- Let me probe that. What do you mean slapped down hard? Slapped down hard by, by, by what? By the system? By, by, by what? Well, by my family and by um, certainly by people who were teaching in my school. I mean, there was just no expectation that if you were a female, you would do anything except get married. And I love telling the story of my three closest friends in high school whose ambitions were to marry a professor, a doctor, and a rabbi, respectively. And they all did. They succeeded? They succeeded. They had ambitions. They knew what they wanted. I didn't know what I wanted. And, 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 and then the, the career came into being? Well, the career came into being, you know, sort of piecemeal. I went to college. I got married. Um, I went to work. I had children. Um, I, I was a science major in college because I thought that was really interesting and challenging. I ended up going to graduate school in molecular biology because I had a crush on a teacher who was in that department, and that was that was as good a reason as any. Um, and the uh, I didn't really fall in love with what I was doing until I was teaching at Brandeis University and was given a nutrition class to teach. It was handed, you will teach nutrition this fall. Um, and oh, it was so much fun. It was just so much fun. It combined my interest in science, my interest in politics, my interest in sociology, my curiosity about why people eat the way they do, my love of food. It just combined it all. It was wonderful. That's really cool. You, you know, I, I, as you know, I've admired your work for a long time, and I love how you infuse joy and a, and, and a clear fondness for food in the middle of all the stuff that you wrote about. <laughs> Tell me about food politics. Let's talk about food politics, because I think it's a term that for you is sort of commonplace. I mean, I think you've, you've inserted that term into sort of a, into the public health conversation. How do you define food politics? What do we mean by food politics? What do you want someone who's getting the top level to take from the meaning of the word food politics? Well, politics is about power and, and get, it's the ability to get done what you want done. And in the food system, um, there, are, there are companies that are worth billions of dollars that are selling food products like widgets, um, and their total goal in life 
is to get people to buy their products, um, regardless of the effects of those products on health or, or the environment. Um, and in order to protect their interests, they use the political system, they lobby, um, they write legislation, they do all of those things. Uh, I mean, they're deeply involved in the political system. And if, if public health advocates and nutrition and food advocates want to have power in that system, they have to use the political system. It was interesting when I wrote the book, which came out in 2002, I thought I was just describing the obvious. And it never occurred to me that it would come as such a shock to people that food was political. I still get asked, what do you mean by what's food and politics? What's that? Um, but it's pretty easy to explain. All right, well, let me let me build on that for a second. So let me go to your latest book in Slow Cook. So Slow Cook, you talk actually about how food politics was received. And you said, you know, it got a, a lot of acclaim appropriately. But then I, I want to read this part from your book. You said, I also got hate mail. Quote, only a communist would suggest that our food supply be regulated by the government. You and your ilk scared the hell out of me as you shaped the minds of our youth. And then you say, I can't remember what I replied to that one, but if I did, I would surely have pointed out that our food supply is already regulated by the government through many agencies in countless ways, and that I wrote food politics in the hope of refocusing those regulations to promote health and environmental sustainability rather than corporate profits. Now, you know, I mean, it's obviously, I, I am completely in, in concord with what, with what you said, but can you talk to me a little bit about, you know, looking back now and having done this for a long time, how do we get better at communicating that the choice is not between you know more or less regulation but really refocusing existing regulation with an eye towards health well we have a government that's essentially captured by corporations um, because corporations have very clear laser-like goal they just need to make a profit for their stockholders that's it's everything is very simple for them. For public health advocates, everything is very complicated. And I think we need to keep the focus uh, very clearly on what we're trying to do. Um, uh, public health is innately radical because it's about equality of opportunity and health for everybody. Uh, that doesn't make any money for anyone. And the, um, you know, how we communicate that, I think it's communicated in lots of different ways. I think people understand it much, much better now than they did even 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I couldn't use the word capitalism in a class without everybody getting really uncomfortable. Now the students talk about capitalism quite freely. Everybody gets that we have to do something to change our capitalist system in ways that will be fair to people who don't have a lot of money. Well, I love many things about that answer. Number one is that public health is inherently radical. It's a really nicely, nice way of putting it. And number two, you know, you're reflecting on something which I've reflected on often, which is that we are seeing progress. I think sometimes when I talk to students, it, it, I think it's hard for students seeing how much they see how much there is to change to see how much has changed. And I agree with you that we're actually at a place where people are much further ahead than they were a long time ago. Let me flip for a second and talk about the moment since we're talking about the moment. Let's talk about the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. You know, people, there has been a lot of conversation about the pandemic and food, and we've talked about, you know, wiping down groceries, ordering in. But I actually think that the pandemic actually reveals something deeper about our relationship to food, you know, supply chains and inequities in food acts. So I'm actually curious, if you look at COVID-19 through the lens of food politics, you know, what do you see? What are some of key learnings from the moment? Well, I saw that Tyson Food wrote the president's executive order invoking the Food Production Act or whatever act it was in order to keep meatpacking workers in the packing plants, even though they were developing COVID like mad. And there were, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of de of illnesses and many, many deaths, um, and those packing plants were forced to stay open against public health advice, um, often with very poor controls over disease transmission. That was, to me, the prime example. The food supply chains were another prime example. And then the most obvious one that 
uh, food producers were destroying vegetables, meat, animals, milk, because they had no way of sending their products to market at a time when families were lined up in cars for miles to get food handouts at food banks because they'd lost their job and didn't have any money to buy food. I mean, I think these things made food system issues really, really obvious. And then also uh, the fact that the Biden administration's uh, efforts to try to relieve the uh, hunger and food insecurity were actually quite effective. Poverty rates went down during the, you know, towards the end of the pandemic. Food insecurity went down towards the end of the pandemic. So that government has a role to play in this that's really important. I mean, all of those things I think were made obvious in ways that most people didn't see before. Hence the free discussion about how capitalist food yes, yes. work. No, and I think I think that gets at this notion, right? As I've thought about quite a bit, which is, you know, the pandemic didn't create anything, right? But it, it elevated to visibility a lot of forces that we've known about. Last question. So you wrote the book on food politics, and obviously you wrote the book food politics, but I mean you wrote the book in a metaphorical sense. <laughs> look ahead, look at look ahead the next uh, 20, 25 years. So what is the vanguard of food politics? Somebody who's watching this, listening to this and saying, I'm really motivated by this. I'm inspired by this. I'm inspired by the joy of food, the way you describe it, and also trying to make that that joy available and equitable to everybody. What should people be focusing on? Where's the field headed? Well, I I hope it's triple duty diets, diets that perform three functions that simultaneously prevent hunger, prevent diet related chronic disease, and prevent climate change. Um, and these are diets that have considerably less beef and considerably more vegetables. I'd like to see our agricultural system transformed to promote health and environmental sustainability rather than corporate profit. Um, and I think that's the direction that the field is moving in, is trying to create a food system that promotes healthy, sustainable diets um, that are good for people and good for the planet. And fingers crossed that we can get there. Marion, it's uh, been a privilege learning from you for the past couple of decades, and I look forward to learning from you much more. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you. Take good care.